Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome. We'll give ourselves a minute here as we all get uh, settled in. I welcome you all to our next uh, installment of Courageous Conversations from Education to Action. Looks like we still have a few more people popping on. Hope you all get a chance to enjoy some of the sunshine that we're having. Okay. Well, welcome to our Courageous Conversation. Uh, today we are focusing on the topic of environmental racism, and I am excited to have uh, Reverend Rashinda Fairhurst with us. I'll give her a bit more of an introduction here in a minute. But first, I would like to introduce our uh, Courageous Conversation organizers or leaders. And I'll have you guys uh, you can just wave your hands like a mad person and introduce yourself that way. We don't need to do individual introductions, I think, at this point. Uh, so first is Sally Snyder with RCC, Jenny Jackson with RCC, uh, Reverend Ernestine Flemister, the rector at St. Luke's Episcopal Church, Reverend Tom Berry, the pastor at uh, Bethany Presbyterian, and I am Ryan Scott. I'm the pastor at Newman United Methodist Church here in Grants Pass. So again, I welcome you all today. We're excited to have you here. Uh, our mission at Courageous Conversations is to enrich, support, and celebrate our diverse community by acting as a catalyst for inclusion, continuous learning, understanding, and acceptance through active engagement and facilitation of educational opportunities that challenge biases and deepen conversations. And before we begin our meeting, uh, we have a couple of quick Zoom etiquette things to go over with you all. Just a reminder to please mute your microphones unless you are speaking. That helps to make sure that we can all be heard. Uh, please keep a stationary position or turn your camera off. I know sometimes you got to get up and move around. Uh, if you do so, please turn off your camera so we don't get all dizzy and uh, distracted. And please, no eating on the camera. And in order to join the conversation or to ask questions, we encourage you to utilize the chat function or the, the raise hand function. Um, and also the chat is a great way if you're having tech issues, we can help you solve those uh, through the chat as well. I wanna go over some of our conversation ground rules. The uh, first one is we are here to create a safe space to learn, share and grow. That's kind of the, the emphasis of what we're doing. So we're committed to open-mindedness to listen to all points of view and be curious. Acceptance, suspend judgment as best as you can. Respect, seek to understand rather than to persuade or convert. Discovery, question old assumptions and look for new insights. Brevity, Go for honesty and depth, but don't go on and on. And sincerity, speak only for yourself about what is personal meaning. And these are adapted from RCC's uh, Conversation Cafe. So and I welcome you all today and I'm excited to have you here. This is an exciting subject and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from Rashinda and from all of you. Uh, today we are gonna uh, uh, Rashida is going to give us a presentation. I'm going to let her introduce herself in just a minute, and then there'll be a period for uh, question and answers at the end. So make sure you get those questions ready. And with that, Rashinda, I'm going to hand it off to you and let you give yourself an introduction and get the ball going. Okay, well, first of all, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, thank you for creating a forum where we can talk about things that may feel a lot bigger than we are. Um, and I'm looking forward to spending this time together. Uh, you might notice things in yourself as we talk about this stuff. You might think, oh, that's terribly wrong or wow, I never thought about it that way before. And, you know, um, let's just hang in there together because this work is messy. And so let's just agree that we're gonna get a little messy together and that's gonna be okay for today as we pull out this thread or that thread and just take a look at certain things from out of a much bigger picture. So um, I'm going to share my screen. 
And here we go. Um, there we go. Uh, let me get into the presenter view as well. Perfect. Okay, so one of the ways I want to start is my name is Rushenda Fairhurst. I am ordained in the United Methodist tradition. And I currently uh, sort of uh, I'm organizing director for a small nonprofit called Circle Faith Future. You probably also noticed that here we are having a conversation about environmental racism and I am a white lady. I am really white. I like all the things white people like. I am in my 50s. I have lived in predominantly white neighborhoods and white areas and that's my social location. That's the place from which I learn and notice about how race impacts myself, my family, my community, my country, and my world. And so I will not presume to speak for anybody else. I am going to try to share voices and share history um, so that maybe together we can better understand, but my location is my own. And I want to just say that out loud and also honor that there are so many different locations just here on the call, let alone more widely. So it's okay to have different points of view. It's okay to have different experiences. Let's try to just move forward in conversation together. So, and Rishanda, um, went, I'm going to yes. interrupt you just for a second. You're not quite in presentation mode. Oh, okay. Um, how's that? There we go. Thank Is, you. That's perfect. That okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. It doesn't really matter because most of my notes are on my lap. Uh, but we're all right. Uh, thank you for that. So I, this, this is why I care about the earth and the planet. This is what brought me to care about the primary part of the work I do, which is looking at things from a perspective of uh, environment and climate and community. This is a picture of the Britannia conservation area as a child behind my home when I was a little girl. I lived in Canada and um, there was this woodland behind our house with birds and turtles and um, frogs. <laughs> and I, I used to reach my hand into this muddy water here. This is called mud pond. And I used to pull out uh, little creatures or try to, I used to watch the tadpoles swim around and it was absolutely enchanting. And it filled me with an absolute love, an absolute love of nature. This is a garter snake. I love how grumpy they are. There was a place in, uh, in behind my home where there was mostly rocks. So there was a lot of forest and there was the Ottawa River, but there was also this place with rocks. And if you turned a rock over, you could guarantee yourself a whole handful of garter snakes. And that was just a thrill for me. I loved, I loved the opportunity to run and play as a child and interact with nature. And this is a view, see how messy this is? This is like bracken and brush and that's the Ottawa River. Um, this is um, a view of what is now the Britannia Conservation Area, but I remember this. I remember running along the edge of the river. I remember the beavers and the muskrats and the foxes and the, the rabbits, and it was a super marvelous place to grow up as a child and to fill me with this recognition that this earth, it's unmatched. It's beautiful, it's sacred, and it's worth preserving. Did I mention the frogs? Because those were in Port Park. So I wanna open with a story. So a couple of years ago, there was a story about two little boys. They were in kindergarten and they had gotten the same haircut and they were best friends and they were so excited because they just couldn't wait, they couldn't wait to go and see their teacher again because they were convinced that their teacher would not be able to tell them apart. That this one haircut would just work, be that magic. They were so aligned in heart and such best friends. There was no way the teacher could tell them apart with this new haircut. Now, these are not those two boys. I don't want to personalize this story. I noticed that the posts have been taken down. And so I'm imagining that it's been a harder story to keep going. Um, so these are two other little boys, but they share the age, they share that mischievous, mischievous joy of the other two. 
And the, um, the story of these two boys kind of, it went viral, right? Huffington Post carried the story. Um, it was charming to us because it sort of named this thing we all just love, this innocence, right? That they love each other so much and they imagine that, um, that they can't be, that no one can tell them apart. The truth is a little harder than that, right? Um, these two boys are going to experience life a little differently in the United States. Uh, and that's just the truth, right? They're gonna have different personal experiences and different personal encounters as they grow up. But their lives, um, uh, we're, you know, society is going to be able to tell them apart, right? So no single, there's no single future for any of us, but part of our fascination with this story, I think, was this like naming of this, like, wow, maybe one day that could really be true. Maybe for these boys growing up, this could be really true. So how do we get to a place where we know that these two little boys are going to encounter life differently? How do we get there? This is where we really start. We're going to throw back hundreds of years. We're going to go back to 1493 and something called the Doctrine of Discovery. Um, as a church person, this really hits home for me. So we're going to go back to Europe. We're going to go back to monarchy. We're going to back to Christianity. And we're going to talk about commerce. This is Pope Nicholas V. And he... Um, he wrote two letters that were essentially law for Europe at the time. The Pope had tremendous power. Uh, these countries were all Catholic in Europe, Christian Catholic countries. Um, and the Pope set the laws for who could do what. And the Pope wrote two letters, one called the Dem Diversa and one called the Romanus Pontifex, that granted, literally granted legal authority to King Alfonso of Portland and his heirs to, and this is a quote, to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever, to take everything they had, their kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities, dominions, possessions, all movable and immovable goods to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery and to get all that stuff for themselves, to apply and appropriate to himself, the king and his successors, all the stuff those people had had in order to convert that stuff and those people to the king's use and profit right? Let's take a breath. That is horrifying. And that was church law and has stayed with us for hundreds of years. So worse than that is what follows next is that here he says that this proclamation, this law was going to be, uh, was issued uh, as a work that demonstrated the glory of God right? It is essentially the right of conquest. And the those who would uh, challenge that right would incur the wrath of Almighty God. That was pretty terrifying. And that happened in 1455 and 1452. This was followed by another pope. This is Alexander the sixth. This was 1493. So Columbus reached the, uh, at the Americas in 1492. In 1493, we get this new law added to the other. This law grants and divides legal dominion and spoils for the undiscovered non-Christian world between two royal families, those ruling Portugal and Spain. So if you were a Christian European ruler already, you're fine. They're not gonna take your stuff. But everybody else, literally from the Arctic Pole to the Antarctic Pole, the earth was split in two and dominion over those two areas was divided between the ruling families in Portugal and the ruling families in Spain, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And again, and again, we see that this is issued with the um, assertion that this is what God would have us do. 
uh, claiming that this uh, law would come at the happiness to the happiness and glory of all Christendom. And the word Christendom is one of those religious words, and it means that the whole globe should be Christian. Um, so this is, this is how I, I don't know how you're feeling right now. Check in with yourself. Um, this is hard to hear. This is hard to hear. This was the law of Europe and the world. So um, this is a statue of Christopher Columbus. This statue is in Barcelona, Spain. And uh, you can see, like, look at how that statue is put together, right? It's like, there's a man, he's got his foot out, he's striding, he looks so confident, he knows exactly where he's going, he's got his finger pointed to the horizon, right? This heroic looking statue. Uh, and this is, this is our cult, what our cultural imagination has done with the, that, those two documents of discovery, that the, uh, the European Christian adventurer, discoverer can go out into these lands and claim them for civilization and for uh, Christianity. Um, and this coin at the very center of our page, uh, that slide, that is a coin featuring King um, Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. Um, and they are, um, and, and, and I've added the coin there because of course this is about money, money and resources, right? This was to enrich who would, who would own all the stuff that these adventurers were going to be quote unquote discovering. Well, the King and Queen of Spain and the King and Queen of Portugal. So this is a letter that Christopher Columbus wrote back to um, the King and Queen of Spain. I'm not sure that it was his first, but it was an early letter. And he describes the land that he has encountered. He talks about how so it's so lovely and so rich. He imagines European settlements there that are that are just doing beautifully, right? For be breeding cattle and towns and villages. He sees the harbors as places where ships can come and exchange goods. He mentions the rivers and he calls, he says that there's such good water here, such good water. And there's trees and fruits and plants, many spices, all those plants and herbs and different flavors and scents, all the food that came from the Americas. And he imagines there's great mines of gold, right? Because gold was very much on the mind of who? Our king and queen of Spain. He also kidnaps some of the natives and um, has them help him with what he's doing. Um, and he notices their humanity. He, he's, he notices that they have very acute intelligence, that they're men who navigate the seas and, and know how to give account for things. So there's an awareness that the people being subjugated here are human beings, and yet it carries on. This is uh, the Christopher Columbus Monument that's in Walla Walla, Washington, right outside the courthouse. Communities all around the country have monuments like this. Um, this particular monument was erected in 1911 by Italian-American immigrants, people who saw that statue of Christopher Columbus and the, the, the air of adventure and mystery and wanted to participate and wanted to have land beneath their feet in farms and be free of their own uh, problems in Europe and come and discover something new, right? This, this story that was told about the, these events. And the dedication reads, dedicated to Christopher Columbus, Il Italy's illustrious son, who gave the world a continent. We shall be inclined to pronounce the voyage that led the way to this new world as the most epoch-making event of all that has occurred since the birth of Christ. So this is, this is erected with, you know, every good intention, right, uh, by Italian Americans who wanted to express their joy and grat gratitude for the place where they were. I want to um, draw your attention to that circle globe that Christopher Columbus statue was resting his hand on. And back to this idea of Christendom in the religious world. 
uh, was that the whole globe would become Christianized. And so the fact that this is included in so many pictures of Christopher Columbus really speaks to that sort of idea that that great progress would Christianize and civilize the world and it would be a wonderful thing. So, oops, I, um, there we go. I'm going to go back to that slider slide. So in uh, on June 30th last year, uh, this statue, like many others, were was um, had was spray painted with stolen land and genocide painted on it. There are petitions to remove the statue, um, and I think when we return to the document of discovery, right, we can see why there might be some very, very different perspectives about what this statue could mean to somebody who lives in the United States, uh, somebody who lives on the land of the Americas, somebody who lives here in the country where I live. Um, and this happens in the Rogue River too, right, the Rogue um, and the, the, the toll that it took on native people. So it was estimated that European arrival in 1492 led to 56 million indigenous deaths across the Americas just by 1600, just by then. And we ourselves in Rogue Valley, where I live in southwestern Washington, you know, we can look at the ways in which the native communities were disrupted and dislocated and met, were met with violence by the trappers, the gold rush, uh, competition for farming resources and settlement, and um, which culminated in the Rogue Valley Indian Wars and forced removal to reservations. So we revisit this idea of why somebody might have spray painted this statue and why somebody might want to take the statues out altogether. So this is the statue in um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and June 10th, 2020, uh, a group of uh, uh, Bad River Band Lake Superior, Lake Superior Chippewa Indians led by Mike Forcia brought the statue down. And um, when they were asked of like, why didn't you wait to go through proper channels to do this if you wanted to do this? His comment was, we've already waited far too long. So this is the Standing Rock uh, Reservation. Um, I was one of 500 clergy when the call went out to come to Standing Rock during the Dakota Access Pipeline protests. I was one who responded to this. It does not make me an expert in anything. Um, it just meant that I felt this deep call within me to be present to this struggle, to learn more, to learn what I could, um, to be a part of an emerging community. If we can find a way to be a community again together, again is a big word there, to find a way to be a community together. So um, this was a beautiful, um, the the encampment itself was, was absolutely uh, an incredible experience. I don't know, uh, people who went to Standing Rock often talk about what a deeply transformative experience it was. And I walked away in a similar, with similar feeling of transformation and that something needed to be done. Um, and um, at the very beginning of my journey, right? I, I am not anywhere near anything yet. I'm still learning. So um, the water is life. So that so here here's an example when we start talking about. So let's start putting you know environment and racism together, right? We've seen the doctrine of discovery how racist that was, right? Um, we've seen the hope and dreams of Americans as they came into the country weren't necessarily overtly racist, but the impact the impact became uh, a one of sort of drawing out the racist systems that were so embedded by the laws that pre-existed us and continued with us. So the original pipeline for the Dakota Access Pipeline route had actually been originally, uh, when they plotted it, they looked at some different routes. And one of the routes they looked at was through Bismarck, uh, north of Bismarck, North Dakota. And they, they decided, nope, they weren't gonna do that even without a fuss, without a single letter, without a single meeting because it would imperil the water of the people in Bismarck, North Dakota, a community that was 97% white. Uh, they decided to reroute it 
um, through uh, the uh, above the Cannonball, uh, the Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota, um, and of course that imperiled the uh, the Standing Rock Sioux's water. But that somehow didn't seem as important or to matter as much. And I really like the words here of the Reverend Karen Van Fossen. Uh, she serves the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Bismarck. And she says, sadly, there are also people who I would say aren't catching the point, which is that the people at Standing Rock are as important as we are and that their water supply is as important as ours. It seems basic, right? But we play out again and again and again actions that imply that this is not true, that we do not value uh, people of color, indigenous people, as much as we value Christian Europeans. And this is based on some really ancient stuff. So this is uh, the Standing Rock Reservation again. This is uh, the sacred fire, we were in a big circle. This is the 500 clergy and the ceremony that is being undertaken here, uh, initiated by the white clergy, um, was the burning of the document, the doctrine of discovery. It had been printed out by Reverend John Floberg, an Episcopal priest in Cannonball, and folks stood around and a, a native woman, a Cherokee practitioner, her name is Coyote Marie Hunter Ripper. She actually lives in Jackson County. She had her clay pot with her. And it was in this pot that the, um, that the doctrine of discovery was burned page by page by page. Um, clergy were so glad to see this thing burn. And we, um, but the legacy, right? We're still, we're still unfolding this legacy. We're still learning about it. We're still trying to figure out where these tendrils got into our legal system and how to get them out. How, do, how did this process of thinking about certain people as less and to be subjugated than others? And how do we get rid of that thinking? That's a really big and important thing to, to, to deal with. So, um, so in shifting a little from the indigenous people of the American continents to the indigenous people of Africa, remember the Portuguese, they were allowed to subjugate everybody in Africa, according to the Pope. And um, they, um, there was a huge movement towards um, abolition. Um, but the first, uh, but that came later, right? At first, into the 1440s, the very first Portuguese ships transported African people who had been enslaved by ship. And it's estimated that 12 and a half million Africans were victims of enslavement and the transatlantic voyage to the Americas. I am not going to post pictures that show people dehumanized or subjugated, right? We've all seen those pictures. I'm not going to post any of them. Um, I love this photo. Um, this is the Howard University class picture from 1900s. It's in the Library of Congress. As we talk about the abolition efforts in the U.S. that began in the 1830s. So this is a like almost 400 year span. It's kind of... Um, disturbing that it took so long to really get some abolition efforts on the books. Uh, Cheney uh, University in Pennsylvania was founded in 1837 by Quakers and was the first historical black college in the U.S. The Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863. Jim Crow laws were enacted in 1890, which is again an attempt to push uh, people of color and, and especially black people down and ensure that the quote unquote order of the doctrine of discovery was preserved where there was Christian white people who had the power and the right to use things and the right to own land. And then there was uh, people of color who did not. Um, in the 88th Congress in the United States uh, passed the Civil uh, Rights Act in 1964. Uh, but here, even here in the Pacific Northwest, there were sundown towns and they persisted into the 1970s. I lived in a sundown town for many years. I had no idea what those were. I did know that my town was majority white. Sundown towns were towns where uh, if you were a black person or a person of color, you could come into the town during the day, you could work as a maid or you could work in the factory or you could work as a laborer, but then you had to make sure that you were out of the town before the sun set. So incredibly racist, pervasive behaviors persisted. Um, 
So pollution inequality. So let's talk about that pollution inequality. Where are we time? Oh, good. Okay, so pollution inequality is one way that we can take a look at measuring, right? Measuring what are the outcomes? What are the things that we can measure? Um, environmental racism not only means that you can come in and subjugate somebody and take somebody's stuff by the doctrine of discovery, which made it into our legal system. It also means that they're not as important. You can imperil their people's water who are, who are um, uh, black or indigenous, um, non-white, non-Christian people, right? Um, although um, Christianity is actually a really powerful force for many black and indigenous communities, um, for those communities that have chosen that and have lived into that. And uh, we have to be, I wanna be really careful around language around that because sometimes it is used right to subjugate. Um, other times it is found as an expression of tremendous empowerment. And we wanna honor that different people, there's no monoliths here, have very different experiences with religion. Um, and so for me, it's been empowering, um, but that's not always true for everybody. So um, the, what happens is the land that certain people occupy becomes ripe for being dumping grounds uh, and, um, and industrial centers. Um, and it, that shows up in measurable statistics like pollution inequality. So uh, fine particulate matter uh, is air pollution in the United States is the largest environmental health risk. And um, it disproportionately affects uh, white, uh, I mean, non-Hispanic, uh, Black and Hispanic communities. And it the measurement here is about how much it affects them versus how much they consume. So it can, it, it's not just their, uh, you know, they're not just dealing with the messes that they make, they're dealing with the messes that everybody makes. Um, so on average, whites experience 17% less air pollution exposure than is caused by what they consume. So I'm freed of some of my pollution burden as a white person in a white community, but black and Hispanic communities experience that pollution because that pollution still exists, right? And they experience 56% to 63% more exposure than is caused by their own consumption. Um, if you live in Texas, so this was a study done by Robert Bullard uh, in the book Dumping in Dixie. Uh, it was a study published in 1979. So in that time in Houston, Texas, 100%, so five out of five Houston owned landfills and 75% of city owned incinerators were in black neighborhoods. So, um, so again, we're seeing the siting of environmental waste, pollution, hazards uh, in areas where the people themselves, their communities and their lives were discounted because they were poor and or people of color and or indigenous. Um, and this just happens over and over again. 75% of privately owned landfills were in black neighborhoods in Houston, Texas at this time. Over 82% of waste disposed in Houston went to mostly back black neighborhoods, even though the city's population was only 25% black, right? And there were laws uh, that were put in place. The United uh, Church of Christ has uh, been tremendously uh, proactive at shining lights on this, talking about it, getting people to move on it. Um, but actually for a while it got worse rather than better. And I want to return to this, uh, this coin, right? Why, why did all this happen? Why are we extracting and taking things, right? Things that don't belong to us. Um, and uh, we go back to this coin and we, I want to talk about Earth Overshoot Day. So Earth Overshoot Day is the day in which we have used up our allocation of resources for the year uh, that doesn't then continue to deplete the planet right, cause depletion. So in 2019, July 29th was the day of that year that we had used up our allotment of what the planet could replenish for itself, right, grow back. Uh, we had mined and sent off fossil fuel emissions and we had used up water and we had used up soil far beyond what the earth could sustain. 
in 2020, that pandemic last year, this year continuing, um, we, that, we got an extra month. That's it, a whole extra month. Earth overshot its consumption on August 22nd, 2020. And this year in the United States, if we just take the United States and what its overshoot day is, we overshot our year's allotment of resources that could be restored or replenished on March 14th. So the reality of what the doctrine of discovery gave license to in the pursuit of wealth for just a handful of royal families is the idea that we can conquer and use and buy and sell. We can use up people, we can use up land, we can use up resources, even when we can't pay it back. So uh, we not only sell our land into debt, but we sell our children who experience generational trauma and the legacy of this planetary depletion. Yeah, some hard words, right? I don't know if you're still with me. Hang in there. I know this is hard stuff. Environmental justice. Woo! <laughs> it's a little bit better to talk about justice a little bit here. So a little uh, environmental justice really sort of was quote unquote born in 1982, although of course there have been lots of efforts by lots of people who saw what was happening as damaging and, and wanted to do something different. But in 1982, 500 people were arrested during protests black farmers tried and failed to stop the dumping of 40,000 yards of PCB contaminated soil on 22 acres of farmland in Warren County, North Carolina. Remember those statistics from Houston about where the dumps were well that's not that wasn't confined to Houston we got these nice numbers out of Houston but the truth is this happened everywhere right um and here's here's that was 82 right remember how I said it's not really getting better we're still struggling with this <clears throat> so black people today are nearly four times likely to die from exposure to to pollution than white people um, African Americans are exposed to 38 percent more polluted air than white Americans and African Americans are 75% more likely to live in communities that border a plant or a factory. So these are just numbers. These numbers that we can look at and ask ourselves, what, why, what is going on, right? So health risks and outcomes are actually heartbreaking, right? So asthma, for example, so that air those air particulates in the air and when you live near a dump and when you live near an industrial area and you live near a fossil fuel plant those particulates are so much higher in your area right and that has impacts on health it has impacts on cognitive function as well uh, non-hispanic african americans were 40 percent more likely to have asthma than non-hispanic whites in 2018 in 2019, non-Hispanic Blacks were almost three times more likely to die from asthma-related causes than non-Hispanic Whites. In 2019, non-Hispanic Black children had a death rate eight times that of non-Hispanic White children. And non-Hispanic Black children were five times more likely to ad be admitted to the hospital for asthma compared to non-Hispanic white children in 2017. So looking at these numbers is really helpful, right? Because sometimes we have been engaged in a, what might be considered gaslighting, right? Where people say, gee, it sure, sure seems worse than black neighborhoods. And other people say, oh no, it's fine. Well, it's not fine. It's, it's not fine. And it hasn't been fine. And the more we can look at it, be willing to look at it, be willing to ask ourselves, why? Why did this happen? How do we get here? What, what could we do differently? What should we do differently? I think that's really the moment, right? We're here. We're here for that question today. So today, speaking of today, what's going on? So the Bahalia Connector Pipeline in Tennessee uh, is a, uh, again, we're back to pipelines, uh, lots of those in this country. So proposed 49 mile crude oil pipeline would connect the existing Valero refinery through South Memphis and Tennessee neighborhoods to the Bahalia Pipeline in Mississippi. 
So South Memphis is a predominantly black neighborhood, uh, such as Boxtown is one of the neighborhoods uh, within that. And these are black homeowners. This is, you know, surprisingly less to do with poverty and more to do with race when you start looking at the correlations, right? So the, this pipeline would go through backyards and it would come within just a few hundred feet of the Doubletree Elementary School. Uh, the proposed routes go around the white neighborhoods. <laughs> uh, they charted it to follow a path through the black neighborhoods. And when they were sort of called out on that, the Plains All-American, which is the pipeline company said right out loud in front of everybody um, that that path was chosen because it was the path of least resistance. So whose resistance matters, right? Who's res I mean, clearly people are resisting, right? Clearly people have been resisting. Um, so whose resistance has been prioritized and why, why is that? Um, so here is, I love this joyful picture. Um, this is Earth Day March in East Oakland, California. And of course they had the Hunter's Point power plant in San Francisco area that just polluted everywhere. And that was a huge fight uh, to get that closed. Um, and sometimes people will claim that black people don't care about uh, environmental justice. This is just another sort of, ah, I don't know how my community, my people, my white people come up with these ideas because this is just not true. Not by everything I've heard, not by the studies. Obviously I'm not black. I can't tell you that as a black person, but it's just, you know, this is, there's so much joy. There's so much energy. There's so much desire from all people to be able to live good lives with good jobs and clean communities where you don't have to worry about industrial pollution. And uh, this joyful woman here holding up this sign green jobs for the hood. And I love this um, uh, quote from uh, Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, who's a great voice for climate injustice. Um, our racial inequality crisis is intertwined with our climate crisis. If we don't work on both, we will succeed at neither. So this is, you know, we start talking about what is a just transition? You'll hear people say, well, well, what we need is a just transition. What does that mean? It means that we don't want to stop burning fossil fuels and address the climate crisis by creating more pollution for Black people and Brown people and Indigenous people, by endangering more water in poorer neighborhoods, right? By declaring that some people are just less resistant, which isn't true isn't at all true. It's about power and power relationships. Let's make sure that we understand that this is a conversation about power relationships, not about resistance, right? Um, we resist it when our water is contaminated and when our food isn't good and healthy, we resist that. So in 1991, uh, there was the first national people of color environmental leadership summit. And uh, there were 17 principles that were brought, were, that were decided on at that summit, which I think are fantastic. And um, the, the, I'll, I'll be posting some of these links in the chat later. Um, so um, the first one, right? The environmental justice affirms the sacredness of Mother Earth, ecological unity, and the interdependence of all species and the right to be free from ecological destruction. So this has, let's rewind 400 years. Let's go right back to Nicholas V and that horrifying document, the doctrine of discovery. And let's just talk right back to him that we have the right to be free from ecological destruction, right? The next one is environmental, sorry, I'm starting to preach. It's the preacher in me. I'll just try to calm down a little bit there. So environmental justice demands that public policy, right, what we decide to do together, what the policies and the laws and the rules are, be based on mutual respect and justice for all peoples, free from the, any form of discrimination or bias, right? So when we start talking about whose water we're going to imperil, whose neighborhoods we're going to imperil. That's a fair conversation where we all sit around the table and have that conversation, right? And, and I think there'll be some motivation to do things differently if we're all equally imperiled by the destruction that we're causing. And then there's the third, the, there's 17 of these. So I've just pulled out the first three. 
environmental justice mandates the right to ethical, balanced, and responsible uses of land and renewable resources in the interest of a sustainable planet for humans and other living things, right? And I, and I think right back to the frogs and the turtles and the, the water and the lake and the river and all the things I got to enjoy that were so healthy and rich and beautiful. I want that for my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. I want that for your great-grandchildren. That, that is what we could have together. That, make no mistake, th we, we can have that together. We just have to figure out how to get there, right? We have to figure out how to get there. And we have to let our, um, uh, our frontline communities lead, right? Um, I think for many people, for me as a white person, it's one of the key things I've learned is, right, I was trained to be the leader, be the one out front, be the one doing it. And um, I'm actually learning that I need to be the learner. I need to be the listener. I need to be amplifying the voices of others. Um, so um, I'm really grateful. To, to be learning these things. So this is a picture of a little girl uh, and a globe. I love this picture. Um, she gives me hope. I want a future for her that is full of clean water and clean air. I want her to know the natural world in a beautiful and life affirming way. Um, and I believe and many do that clean water, clean air and nature are human rights, right? We are part of this earth, right? To be conserved, preserved and shared by all. So uh, these are some notes. I'm gonna post some of this into the chat. And then uh, that is the end of my slideshow. We're at 42, so it's only a couple of minutes. I'm gonna stop the slideshow share. And then I imagine you might have questions. I want everybody, if you can, to just, that's a very commanding way to say things, but I would invite you, I would invite you to check in with yourself and see how you're feeling. Put your feet on the ground and know that you're here, you're okay. We're together, we have community. We can talk about these things and we can, um, some of us are gonna have a lot of pain hearing that in ways that other people haven't experienced. Other people frustration or anger or sorrow, right? Um, so all those things are true, but also hope, 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 hope. When we tell the truth together, we can change things together. We can do things differently because we're not in the dark. We don't like, what's the doctrine of discovery? Like I had no idea. And when I learned about it, wow, did I ever want to speak to that and, and say, Hey, we can't do it that way. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's my offering for today. And I hope that it has been worthy of your time. Well, thank you so much, Rashinda. It's been a pleasure to listen to you. And we do have some time for questions. Uh, I'm going to invite folks to use the raise hand feature. And I may need some help uh, moderating this from uh, maybe, uh, uh, Sally or um, whenever other leaders can help moderate the uh, people who raise their hands. That way I'm not tracking down everybody. But if you have a question to ask, I invite you to, uh, at least on my screen, it's at the bottom of the screen. If you go to reactions and you click raise hand, uh, you can raise your hand and ask Rashinda a question. And I invite you to keep your questions uh, pithy. That way we can make sure we fit people in uh, who have questions. So. And, and I would add too that remember that people are listening to your question. Now that seems silly to say out loud, but I have in the past erred in saying something that made sense to me, but was actually a pretty hurtful thing to say out loud. So when you say your question, speak your truth but be aware that there are people listening as well. Thank you. Oh, I'm terrible at finding hands that are raised also, Ryan, so I'm gonna count on you to help me with that. Let's see. And I am putting things into the chat uh, as well. Oh, yes, Judy. Hi, everybody. I'm Judy Basker with the Rogue Community College Foundation. Thank you very much for sharing that interesting information. And I have more of a comment than a question. I just uh, wanted to acknowledge that 
it's probably been 15 years since I've started to become uh, really aware of the differences in uh, different kinds of communities. And I heard a speaker once whose name has escaped me, but uh, African-American environmentalist who was raised, I think, in the Bronx. And she had a dog and she would take the dog out and try to find places. And she realized after a while, this is crazy. There aren't any parks in my neighborhood. It's all cement. It's all this. And it, it got her into this whole world of study. And I learned a lot from her about how what you're saying is true that uh, and we have so many communities of color where the incidence of various illnesses are high because the exposure to chemicals is so high. And I'm just really glad that it's something we're looking at and talking about. So I appreciate your, your share today. Thank you. Anyone else have a question or a uh, comment? Well, Judy, you could, since you're the only one raising your hand, I'll let you go again. Okay, yeah, okay, I'll keep going. What, what, just curious from the group here, what can we do to make, to improve this? I mean, we've got the awareness now, we're thinking about it, but, and you know, we happen to live in a mostly uh, environmentally uh, conscious or, you know, in a lovely area that doesn't have a tremendous amount of pollution is what I'm trying to say. Does anybody have any ideas what we can do to help help with this? Well, while we think about this, I think Dorothy Swain had raised her hand. Uh, Dorothy, do you want to go ahead? I do not have a, a, an answer. Excuse me, sorry. I do not have an answer uh, or an idea for Judy's question. I have a question of my own, which was something I heard at a, an environmental racism workshop um, over last summer, which is how do we start to dismantle a system that benefits us personally? And I, and to me, that question just had such resonance for me, because as a uh, white person who has benefited from my whiteness and who is a homeowner and um, who is planning to retire early, um, I, there are, there are things that I have that I, I value, and it is it is hard. I, I'm also quite radical at my core and I want to change things and I want to, um, but I'm also fearful. And, I, and when I talk to people who are like me, I feel that fear coming from them as well. And so just how, how do we start to talk about this in ways that make it real about what we're going to need to give up? I think that's what I'm trying to ask. So this is, I think, a really important question. So by 2030, we have to cut our emissions in half. And our communities of color are saying, don't cut that, those emissions on half at our expense. Include us in the benefits that that will bring. So please don't just march off in your dominant way. Um, and the other thing that happens is a tremendous amount of sorrow Right. As we get a sense of what we have lost, what we have done, and the losses, right, the grief of it all, um, nobody likes to lose anything, right? Like you're all those little goodies, all those consumer goodies that we don't really have to fully um, experience the impacts of and other people do to rethink those and rethink, wow, you know, um, I'm going to have to step back. I'm, I'm not going to be the one in front of this movement. I'm going to be the one encouraging uh, others, right? That, that can be experienced as loss. And I would actually turn the question over to, to all of us. H how do you cope? How are you thinking of, of, uh, in, of engaging that question? Oh, I see Nicole Slinger. I don't necessarily have a solution, but I know how I cope and I can 
share um, some strategies maybe that have helped me. One is to not do it alone. Um, I think any time that I've tried to make a change, it's always been helpful to have people uh, either supporting me or changing with me. Um, and it can make it even more fun as opposed to it feeling just like a, a very fearful, grief-stricken, um, guilt-laden something, something process, but to really help both with the emotional process uh, because there, there may be grief and all of those other feelings, but then also to, um, you know, this, you can create a little group of your friends who are setting goals on your own consumption and your own ways of um, whatever ways that you want to make change um, regarding your, your impact personally. Um, you can create, and it can be a, almost like a fun, supportive way of um, of adjusting your lifestyle, so to speak, um, which can be more inspiring than it, it can really off offset, I guess, the, the grief or the challenging emotions. So to get, to get a little tribe around you basically would be my recommendation. I love that. Um, don't do it alone. So trauma, generational trauma, climate trauma, we're all sort of dealing with that. Uh, the trauma of racism and the legacy of that. Um, don't, but the invitation to not be alone with it, right? We can, we can actually carry a lot of things, but not alone. So I thank you so much for that's a huge and important point. I see Jenny with her hand up. Yeah, we had a question that came up in the chat um, that says, do people need to think more about using electric vehicles? And then also followed up with, and also adding solar panels. <laughs> so yes, big yes. On the climate front, absolutely yes. We are, that 2030 number is less than a decade away. And we have to pull our admissions in half by that time. Um, uh, highway fuels are a huge uh, consumption uh, uh, metric for us. We're going to need to pull that down to EVs. And where are we not going to be building uh, solar uh, um, solar cells? And where are we not going to be dumping the waste from our uh, heavy metal productions, right? Thinking about that ahead of time, right? We're not gonna be creating and adding to environmental racism as we make our transition to clean energy and clean fuels. I, that sounds so edicty because I don't know, I just like, that's so important to me. Let's not do that. Let's not, let's please not do that. Uh, Georgia, you've got your hand raised. Yes, um, I was wondering how we could um, convince our fellow citizens here in Grants Pass to participate in a composting system for our food waste. Uh, food waste generates a lot of methane in the landfill and yet it can be so easily composted. Most of us aren't doing it in our backyards but we could do it in the community as a whole. That's something I'd like to see us accomplish somehow. Anybody Sometimes, have... whoop, I don't know if you're done. Sorry, I thought you were, but then you... Does anybody have any ideas? <laughs> so uh, your city council is a great place to start. Just raising awareness, changing laws locally, trying to find ways to create community opportunities for, for uh, food waste. Uh, Project Drawdown is a fantastic resource for how to lower uh, the climate uh, emissions that we have to grapple with. Um, also, food waste means that people go hungry, so we have a lot of hungry people in this world, and it's not because we don't produce enough food, it's because we don't share it. Um, so that's something to think about as well. Um, so yeah, so I would say sometimes, uh, so it's like this balance between the grassroots and changing laws. So the doctrine of discovery was a law. That law came in and it changed a lot of things. So we can use some, some laws and policies that are built from the community up to change things as well. And I would say, um, talk to people and go to your city council and kind of start there. But what about other ideas? Has anybody got other ideas or have done this and want to share about it? I see Travis raise his hand or is there someone else first, Ryan? I've seen big impacts with like uh, urban renewal um, being targeted in places like a lot of times urban renewal is focused on the most affluent areas um, as opposed to, you know, um, really focusing on creating like environmental spaces that 
connect communities and you know and, and, and focusing on areas that are underserved um and like even the greenway gets a lot of talk um but that you know there's there's area like there's even the areas in say the greenway that get a lot of attention are tend to be the most affluent areas um things like that Um, and, uh, Ernestine has her hand raised, but I want to mention before you speak, Ernestine, that we are coming up on our hour. So I think Ernestine is going to be our last uh, share today, and then we will announce our next uh, courageous conversation. But Ernestine, uh, go ahead. Uh, two things. One is uh, Georgia is starting a petition to take to city council. So when you go to talk to them, and you know, there's always the pushback. Oh, you start, you do something. It's not what you can say. You do something. You can already have your petition to to show uh, second thing is rashida i i i don't know this if, if it's this happened or not has the do, has the vatican ever rescinded the doctrine of discovery that's a good question i don't think so not um i know that there have been many religious groups and nuns especially who have demanded that they be fully retracted um that was this as late as like 2018 um, with this new pope, I should I should check that. Um, I don't know. I don't think so, though. Sadly, um, there may be in part, but I, but I don't want to misspeak either. So I, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. But that's I should find that out. That's uh, and when you do, share it with us, please. Yes, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for sharing, uh, Sally. I'm assuming we have a slide for our, our next. Uh, conversation coming up in uh, May. No, I did not create a slide, but I- okay. Oh, you muted yourself. <laughs> I was unmuted. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I did not create a slide uh, this time, but I'm posting in the chat that next month we have a guest speaker, Ron Jones. Uh, he will be talking, he's from Dialogues on Diversity and the subject matter is civil discourse, putting the civil back into civil discourse. And that will be Tuesday, the 25th at noon, uh, 25th of May. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for being here today. And a special thank you to Rashinda for sharing with us today. Uh, we've really valued this time with you and I hope to have you back in the future, maybe. And I uh, hope to see you all next month as we continue our uh, courageous conversations with one another in our communities. But thank you all for being here and hope you all have a lovely week and afternoon.